Welcome to the Route Consultant Weekly Webinar, uh, and this is the last of our new ones this week. This is for the waste industry, uh, and this is a really interesting space that I imagine most of you may not have even realized was an opportunity here, uh, and this is our first of many to come in the industry. So welcome to everyone who is here live or will be watching this later. My name is Josh Gregory. I'm the Vice President of Education here at Route Consultant, and my goal with this and all these opportunities is just to help all of you learn about these spaces and then as you get into it as you get excited help accelerate your journey into them uh, and now if you are here live if you're here on the webinar right now we will have a q a at the end of this webinar so if there are any questions that come up as we're talking or anything that you want us to dive into while we're here we will have a live q a at the end just make sure that if you have questions that you put them in the q a button at the bottom of the window if you put it in the chat it's nice that you put it there, but I will miss it and I, and I won't get to your question. So if you want your questions answered, put it in that Q&A button at the bottom. So uh, like I mentioned, what we are focused on today is the waste industry and all of that entails and what waste routes are. Uh, and I am not the expert on this one. <laughs> so the good news is that I've brought someone on to be on our team here who is. Uh, so we have partner partnered with uh, Tommy Turbyville who will be on these webinars every single week to help all of you understand the opportunities and then find the best ways to move forward if you're interested. So Tommy, I see you there. If you wanna just go ahead and say hi and then we'll get started. Good afternoon, folks. Look forward to uh, working with you and help you understand the industry. Perfect. Uh, and now, now, Tommy, on this first one, I really want this to be a way for people to, to understand the industry and just kind of understand what it looked like for you when you kind of found out about it and got into it. But but let's start kind of from the beginning. So just really simply, you know, where did you grow up? Where did where did you start your uh, your kind of career? Well, I am uh, from the Nashville area, grew up there, have not always lived there. The waste <laughs> industry actually moved me around about uh, seven different cities while, while okay. I was in the industry. Yeah, it's there. Are, I'm also from Tennessee, and there's very few of us remaining here. You know, it's always a, a pleasure to run into to people who are actually from here with the amount that come in every day. And, you know, I talk to people all the time and they say, yeah, I'm basically from Nashville. I've been here for five years, uh, but it's it's nice to actually uh, have somebody on the team, too, who's uh, born and raised here. We'll we'll treasure the few of us that remain. <laughs> so uh so how early was it that you first kind of found out about the waste industry well i tell folks it, it wasn't uh, it was wasn't my intention to find out the way i did <laughs> yeah. uh my dad had a waste company okay. and when i was 13 years old i was planning on being out uh we had had a big snow snowstorm and i was planning on uh uh, playing in the snow, but at 530 in the morning, I am uh, woken up and told it's time for me to earn my keep. And from that point forward, <laughs> if I wasn't in school, I, I was in the waste business. Yeah, it's one of those where, you know, you weren't volunteered, you were voluntold to join the waste <laughs> industry. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, it's, it, I think you've got a really nice perspective there. You've seen it for all different kinds of ways from beginning to end since you've kind of you you literally grew up in it <laughs> so um now i know you kind of said that, that this isn't um <clears throat> it's it, you you almost didn't have a choice in the matter but was there ever a point early on where you tried to get out of it but it pulled you back in and, and what was it that kind of kept you there in those early days well like i said i didn't have a whole lot of choice you know <laughs> there when i wasn't in school but I swore I was not going to be in the industry as a, as a teenager going through. I'm like, nope, I'm not going to do this. My plans were to be a high school band director. So okay. went to college on a music scholarship. But then uh, during that time frame, I had a lot of friends that were graduating and not having jobs and all types of with all types of uh, different degrees. And so uh, I thought, well, maybe I need to think about this. My uh -huh. my dad always supported me in whatever I wanted to do, but he always made sure I was aware he had an opportunity. And so I guess um, that it, as as I saw that, it's like, well, I know I have to I have to have a job and, and pay yeah. the bills. So uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I got to at least do something. And, and that's kind of what pulled you back. So so the, importantly, what did you play, Tommy? What what did you you majored in music? What did you play? Trombone. Okay. 
That's I do not know very many trombone players, so that's probably. Do you, do you ever still break it out? Is it still? Do you, <laughs> when's the last time you I played? Do, I, it's been years since I played it, but I do still have have one up in my attic, just in case. You know, just just, just in case. case. <laughs> right. So, so before we go too much farther in your journey, kind of talking through what this looks like for you, just high level. I know, I know that there's a lot of, of different things that that go into this space, but. Just talk really, you know, what are the, I think there are really three different major components of this space. So what would you, when people say waste routes and they're talking about it, what is, what is the space at a high level? Yeah. So, so the waste industry is really a service logistics industry is, is what it is. Uh, one of the great things about it is when you think about it, every occupied space has waste and they have to have some method to get rid of it. And so very high level, that's what it is. But there's really three distinct lines of business. Uh, and I'll kind of walk through those. They, those are somewhat determined by the type of customers you have, the amount of waste volume, and and as much so the type of equipment that you use to collect it. So we'll start off with residential. Residential is exactly what you think it is. It's basically picking up waste at homes. It's typically, you know, single single family duplexes things of that sort um it it also has the biggest variety of types of equipment that people use uh there are some people that do it in in pickup trucks to flatbeds but uh, of course the most common are are compaction trucks and those trucks are typically known as rear loaders or side loaders the industry uh it's a monthly service fee and that's really how you get paid. Uh, there are two different types. There are basically subscription and municipal contracts. Subscription is where you have individual agreements with folks. Uh, those are typically billed quarterly in advance in how you get the revenue, but the other is municipal contracts. So uh, those are large chunks of business where municipalities now provide service for residences and uh, they they most of those there are some that still self-perform but most of that they outsource and so huge opportunity uh with municipal contracts the other is what's called commercial and it's basically the mid volume it is the type of um, uh, customers like convenience stores and fast food restaurants and smaller retailers uh they're the ones that that uh, use the front end loader trucks. That's what they're called. And it's very simple. It's the ones that have the forks in the front, go into the container, dump it over. There are, there are about four different sizes of containers. I tell folks, if you want to get a feel for the size of containers, go behind a strip mall, because typically there you get a view of what everything is there. Almost all of that work is individual, you know, customer to your business uh, type of agreements. And again, it's a monthly service fee and bill typically month in advance. And then the third is, is what's called industrial and construction. These are the ones that have high volumes or big bulky uh, items that they need to get rid of. And so this is like, uh, you know, the big box retailers, manufacturing plants, uh, big, uh, big grocery stores and the other huge sector is contractors. So construction sites, this is typically what you see there. The type of equipment there are roll off trucks. And it is because it, the container is like the bed of a truck and it rolls on and off the truck. Most of those are straight trucks, but there are some that are that are trailers. Th this is one that is a little different. The revenue there comes based on the number of times you service that particular location. Perfect. That's the three. That, yeah. That's the three lines of business. Yeah. And I think that's I think it's really important to, you know, just as you're thinking about this and hearing about this space for the first time to see that there is a pretty large range of what these different businesses can look like, what the different day to days can look like. Your business could be composed of all three of those lines, just one. Uh, you know, a lot of those different options exist when you're thinking about this space. And there's going to be pros and cons of each. We won't go into all of that today, but that is the, the types of things to be thinking through as you're considering this space. But let's, let's you know, step back a little bit, Tommy, and, and just walk us through, you know, you started at 13. What did that journey look like with your family business? 
Yeah. So it, it, my dad owned the business. I have two brothers that are older than I am. And and so uh, short version is dad had a partner years prior and they had growing pains instead of going together and getting a bigger facility. One partner kept the commercial side of the business and stayed where they were. Dad moved the resident, took the residential side and moved uh, to the basement of our house. Okay. And so I literally grew up in, in the offices, you know, when I, as I got older, bedroom was in was in the basement. And so uh, started off that at that time, almost everybody had to do their own individual. It was a subscription service, but the, the municipality started annexing and providing that service. And we ended up being the largest uh, private residential contractor for, for waste in the city of Nashville. But as we looked at that, we knew that things um, would eventually be bid and we had a chance of, of growing or losing everything. And we decided we needed to, to diversify. And, and our diversification was getting into the commercial side of the business. And as a result of that, we were growing extremely fast. We were growing, uh, we were adding a commercial route every nine months. And we had no sales force. It's not like we had a sales force. Uh, it was really based on the reputation that that the uh, company had had developed with people in their homes. And and so that's how we got into that. Because of that growth, we got the attention of uh, two big national players. And with what was going on in the economy at the time, we made the decision uh, to talk to both of them. So, you know, what was going on in the, the economy in the early 80s, uh, you know, interest rates were at double double digits. You know, uh, we we all had our houses, our personal houses signed for collateral because we were growing so quick with the banks. They're like, you know, we're not just going to give you give you this money. And uh, and so as a result of having talked with both both of these companies, uh, we made a decision we were going to sell. Uh, it's you know, it's kind of funny. Both of the companies told my dad he could come along if he wanted to, but who they really wanted was his three boys. So, you know, the need for, I guess, talent, you know, is, wasn't any different then than it, than it is today. So, um, so we ended up selling. As a result of that, that's kind of when I started my journey. Within 18 months, uh, I was asked to relocate. And over the years with, with them, I relocate, relocated seven different times. I had kind of become the uh, fix-it guy where facilities and operations uh, would not be performing as expected. But, you know, it, that also gave me a great opportunity to build teams, to manage landfills, to manage transfer stations, to uh, work on permitting landfills. Uh, to buy companies, to close down some operations that weren't uh, profitable, uh, and to also get into some peripheral businesses that they wanted to try. One was street sweeping, uh, which uh, was not a big success, but the other was portable toilets that fit well in the with the construction side of the business. So, uh, you know, so so for my forty plus year career, I've been in the service and logistics business. Yeah. And and I think that's huge for everybody who's here and trying to decide to enter the space and, and trying to know what questions to ask and who to go to. Not only has Tommy been in a business that grew, got really large, diversified, he's gotten in all different types of it. He's also seen an exit, which I think is really important. No matter no matter when or or what size business you try to get into, it's always important to also have a game plan for how you eventually want to exit and, and plan that from the beginning. So Someone who's gone through that side is just as important, but also all of the things he did with the large management companies where he's seeing all different kinds of companies, what they're doing well and what they're not, and helping optimize those decisions is only going to help you as you're trying to go through this journey as well. So I think that's that's really helpful, Tommy, to just kind of get that background for everybody when they're looking at this for the first time. Um, now, you know, I, I know you've seen all kinds of things, but I just want to pull back and, and do a couple of quick questions for people who are really thinking about this and trying to conceptualize it. So, you know, as you're getting started, you know, what's, what would you say is the hardest part about getting started in this space? Well, it, it's really a learning curve of understanding the business. And, and I would say it's, it's probably a, a couple of items. 
One is understanding the disposal cost and how that fits into the pricing. Different different types of customers have have you know different types of waste. You pay for disposal based on weight in most instances, and so it's just kind of understanding that the different container sizes and just kind of getting a grasp on that so you can make smart business decisions on on pricing and, and growing the business. And the other is, is again, just a learning curve. It is understanding what you should expect out of a wrap. You know, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that, that you're maximizing these, these uh, compaction trucks are not cheap. And so you want to make sure you're, you're maximizing your return on that investment and kind of just understanding, okay, what makes sense to do that? Because you don't want to invest that kind of money and not be as efficient or only have two days worth of work, you know, for, yeah. for that particular investment. Yeah. And understanding benchmarks and what you can expect out of that investment is huge. And that's, that's always a part of this that nobody knows going in as, you know, it feels good. Is it, am I doing well? Am I doing, you know, should I be doing twice as good as I am? So I think that's, I think you're right that that's something that it's difficult to know unless you've got you know, data or somebody who's done it before to help you kind of understand it. Now, I, I think this is an interesting thing to think through. So, you know, you've seen all different kinds of businesses and you saw your own uh, family's business and how it grew and changed. If you could go back to some of the early days, is there anything that you would have changed or tweaked about how you all ran the business? Something that you might encourage people to do early on that you you're, you may have seen your family miss well, I, you know, it's one of it's one of those things that my mindset is that I wouldn't change anything because I would have missed all the learning experiences that uh, I, I would have had. But, you know, I think um, for us, the first thing that comes to mind when you ask that is I probably would have pushed to hold off a couple of more years before we sold the company. And and the reality is we were we were growing. I'm convinced that growth would would have continued. And then uh, the the biggest thing is that the um, the multiples grew pretty substantially <laughs> within a couple of years after we did that. So uh, it, you know that's the, that's the first thing. But it, it you know there's so many things trial and error. But but you learn from them. You adjust quickly and, and move on. Yeah, I think that's the right mindset. But at the same time. Everyone else gets the benefit of seeing the things that you guys did well and didn't and learn from those mistakes of it so that they don't have to make the same ones. Right. Um, now, what, what would you say is if you could think about, you know, what was the biggest surprise? You know, we're talking early days. You're like, I don't know if I want to do this. And then you end up doing it for 20 years. So, so thinking back, what was some of the, the good surprises you found in the industry? Well, I, I mean, the good surprises is, is everybody has waste. And okay. so... Over the years, the opportunity to, to learn about a lot of different types of business in the industry, because, you know, some of those, they bring you, hey, this is how we operate. This is what we do. This is how we generate. And, and so uh, that was one of the pleasant surprises is I didn't really think about the opportunity to see how so basically every different type of, of business operates. So that was one of the pleasant surprises. And it was uh, very educational. Yeah, and it's and that'll only help you, you know, as you're moving forward, whether it's waste or not, that's all really helpful education as you're thinking about how to progress your career later. Yeah. Uh, now, I think this is always one of the things people that are trying to think through is, will I be good at this? So, so if you're trying to think through what makes a good operator, any kind of characteristics or any kind of things that you would you'd recommend for a good operator? Uh, yeah, I... I always try to keep things in like three buckets. And so uh, the first one I would say is probably you need to be a service fanatic. In, in this space, most people don't want to think about their waste at all. All they want to do is take it out and it disappears. Yeah. And as long as that happens, uh, you, you get a great reputation. So, so you do that. I mean, that's the whole reason we were growing our business in a totally different segment as fast as we were is because we were somewhat service fanatics. You do what you say when you say you're going to do it. Um, the, the other is you really need to be a stickler on fleet maintenance. Again, these trucks are expensive. You can't go down to, you know, down the street and find a truck you can rent. 
And so making sure you main, maintain um, maintain your trucks and keep them on the on the road and keep them safe. And then the third, I would say, is you need to be a strong people leader. Again, a, a big part of this is, um, you know, your people, there is some manual work in this. It's not just driving. And and so making sure you you are a great leader of, of the people that you have is is important. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's I think everybody can resonate with that and, and start to think through, you know, where that fits with what their skills are, what they may need to add to their skill set to to get ready for that. Um now just you don't have to go down a long list, but if you were just going to give quick pros and cons of the industry, what would you kind of throw out? Well, I'll start with the cons. Uh, it, and one of them is just what everybody is dealing with today is, is just, you know, staffing people, maintaining fleet, you know, the supply chain on being able to get parts and th those things. I mean, that's definitely a challenge today. Uh, but you also could, in certain areas, you could have uh, some some additional challenges on hiring because there could be a stigma of people not wanting to be a garbage man. Mm -hmm. uh, although it's not like it was when years ago, but it is that stigma. So uh, it, it, you have to have a very robust, you know, recruiting plan and un understand that's a challenge. Um, and the other is a whole lot of times you have, well, most times you have no say of, of a disposal cost increase. And so that's one of those things you don't know it's going to increase. And so uh, you have to feel comfortable and be able to make those adjustments on things that are totally outside your control and being able to do that. But you can't sit there and say, well, I'm going to hold this price because you'll see your your uh, margins deteriorate rapidly. Mm. Yeah. Um, and on a pro side, I I would say it's the consistency. Uh, the routes are consistent. You know, Mondays are are basically the same week after week after week. Um, and the and the other is the revenue. Since the vast majority of this is a monthly service fee for that particular location, the revenues remain very consistent. And so, uh, you do have some peak times and and down times, but but it's not substantial at all. Um, and then the third, I would say, it's recession proof. People are always going to have waste, mm -hmm. and so uh, the the issue of of a recession coming in and you not having waste it doesn't happen. So I would say it's probably the three pros. Yeah, I, I yeah, I wish that there was something that would mean I didn't produce massive amounts of waste in my house <laughs> every week. Um, but yeah, I think you're you're very right on that last one in particular that. There's really nothing you can do. That's it's going to be consistent. You're going to need the garbage to take it out. And and I think it comes back to the, what you said earlier, which is I think really interesting of just the the thing that people want most when it comes to their garbage is that they don't think about it and it disappears magically. And so the, as much as you can do that, uh, the more successful you'll be. So um, we do have a few Q and A. I'm, I'm going to go through the questions here. And then uh, as I'm talking, if anybody else has any additional questions, i um, happy to go through them and answer those as well. Uh, but a uh, first one here. So, you know, Tommy, sometimes you see these large players like waste management that have a large uh, foothold in the market. Do you ever see them subcontract out to anyone or do they try to keep everything internally once they've got it? Do you kind of have to look elsewhere for routes? Uh, it, most of the time you have to look elsewhere. They, they do very little uh, subbing out of work. Uh, mm -hmm. but you've got to understand every customer they have, uh, is probably an individual agreement and they, uh, it, you know, one of, one of the negative parts of being a large company is it's, this is the only way we do it. And so, uh, sometimes that frustrates people. And I, I will tell you the other thing, they are, uh, the big companies do a lot of rate increases on a mm. frequent basis. And so, you know, over the years, modest rate increases people accept, but sometimes, you know, just for no reason, there's not a disposal increase. So, so it is still a great opportunity. Don't think just because they're there that uh, you can't continue to grow your business. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, a lot of times we see those pick up residential tracks in like a, in a municipality Do, is the, are the commercial and industrial markets more fragmented than what you might think of as a residential market? Yeah, much more so. Is yeah. so it, even even if a municipality, it, most municipalities only provide service for the households, not for the businesses. And so even within the municipalities, the businesses are still individual. They make a decision on that, just like they do who who they buy their copier paper from. Yeah. And so I think when you're thinking about this, uh, you know, you may say, ah, oh, well, my trash is picked up by a large companies. So there's no opportunity nearby me. I think it's always you should always think about those opportunities because if you can win those municipality contracts, that's great. It's a lot of business and it's something that's really consistent. But there are a lot of opportunities. That's why we're trying to to talk about a few of these different segments here that may be close by you and it just might not even be something you realize exists, like those businesses or those industrial segments. Uh, and there's kind of a side question here. So you know, you mentioned transfer stations. We didn't really go into it. Uh, in too much depth, but do you ever see anybody contracting with waste management to transfer the loads between transfer stations, or do they still keep all of that internal? Have you ever seen those types of work? Uh, yeah. Be yeah, yeah, I have seen the transportation side of that be contracted out. Yeah. They do that sometimes because, again, they do that just to feed primarily if they have their own landfill. And uh, again, their their core is picking up businesses and houses and i have seen that contracted yeah and landfills are a whole other side of the equation and, and you've had some experience there but i think that you know if, if people maybe we'll do a webinar on it one day just so that people understand the opportunities there but also understand the challenges of getting there and actually having a landfill but i think i think that's something we can come back to later just because i think i think landfills are important and interesting because it helps you understand how kind of the whole system works how the larger companies are thinking about volume and what, what they care about, because they're all just trying to get more trash into that landfill because it is extremely profitable. <laughs> yes. um, now, you know, we don't want to go, we can't go too far in depth on this because it's a longer conversation, but um, what, what, what's kind of the process of, of selling a business look like from, you know, is it something where you have to get approval from a large uh, company? Because, you know, this is somebody who's done the FedEx side and they know kind of what the FedEx transfer process looks like. How is it a, a different on this side? Can you just go out and and buy existing waste routes? And, and I know that you sold your family business, so there's at least some of that. Yeah, it, for the most part, the only thing you would have to answer to is if you did have a municipal contract and you would have to get a, a, a approval to transfer it to whoever was was buying buying it. But it's not like there's, you know, uh, another company like FedEx or something of that sort that you have to get approval from. Because, again, the, the vast majority of your customers are individual businesses. So it's not um, it's just a matter of going through and um, making the deal. Yeah. So whether they're customers that transfer or contracts, you know, if, if it's actual contracts, it's a little more complicated. It just depends on. Uh, if it's a municipality contract or you know with a specific customer uh if it's a if it's a stock sale it's obviously there's a lot of things that are easier but even if an asset sale a lot of those things will still transfer it's just a part of the transition conversation but important things for those of you who've been on the fedex or amazon side is you don't have to deal with fedex or amazon being that third unknown that jumps in and just muddies the waters on every deal it is typically between a buyer and a seller um, now I know this is a, it could be a longer answer here, but can you just talk a little bit about, you know, if a city's putting up a contract for bid, uh, for the municipality, what does that process look like? Yeah. I mean, typically the, the one thing that they do typically require is three to five years in the industry. Now, you know, I've seen companies that have been bought that have used personnel to justify that time frame when, when you buy a company to be able to do that. But but typically it's just like any other government contract. They they have pre-bid conferences, you know, to go through and explain what they expect. They send out bid specs, everything they expect, and then you offer a rate per unit for the area that they have. Sometimes they provide you the number of units. Sometimes they expect you to provide them the number of units that are in there and then they validate it. So, uh, but, but that's really 
uh, what it is. They, they they do not always go with the low rate. I can tell you that just from experience. Um, you know, I, I've gotten many contracts, you know, over the years and not be the lowest, actually some where I was actually the highest. But um, so, yeah, I mean, it's uh, just like any other government bid, but it's not extremely complicated. Biggest thing is making sure you get on the bid list. <laughs> right. Be in the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And and we can, I think that is, like I said, that's a longer conversation. And if you're going through a process where you're already an existing contractor or you're looking at those types of bids, there's more that we can do to help you out in those specific conversations. Uh, a quick one here. Somebody asked, you know, where will this webinar and our, where will our webinars live? Uh, we will have them posted. They may not be posted yet, but we post those all on the Route Consultant YouTube page. So they'll all be live there. If you miss the webinar uh, on any given day live, we will always post those on our Route Consultant YouTube page for you to see. Um, now, a, a couple of these questions, and I know that there's like a lot, uh, a lot that goes into it, and this is kind of a, a broad range of questions. But when you're thinking about the, you know, typical revenue or size for a business, or even uh, gross revenue per route. Are there any rough numbers you can share there or rough profit margins that you kind of see or expect? Yeah, it, I would tell you the the commercial and the resident, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the industrial construction and the residential, you want to look at twenty two dollars to $28,000 per route. Uh, when you start getting into the front end loader commercial, because again, you're providing the containers, uh, you're looking at well in excess of 40000 that you'd be looking at per route on that. I will tell you, well-run waste routes, residential, 15 to 35% margin is not unusual. And 20 to 40 is not unusual on the uh, industrial or commercial. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's that's pretty common. Uh, and And what I would say is we wanted to share those numbers so that you can get a sense of it. There's a, we will give you more kind of in-depth financials and some of the, the content we'll be posting, some of the summits we'll have, so you can go through those and have uh, actual uh, listings for you to look at and numbers for you to look at there. But those are pretty consistent with what we've seen and what you can kind of expect from this space where, you know, you can kind of think in some ways, for those of you who are used to the FedEx model, you can kind of think of the residential size being a little bit closer to P&D, where there's more stops, uh, and it's more of the kind of, uh, you know, little stops that pay less per amount, and there are kind of more little things to, to worry about from an efficiency and route perspective, uh, whereas commercial and industrial still have some of that, but there are fewer stops. It's in some ways closer to the line haul model, and it's not going to be a perfect correlate there. But there are some of those uh, analogies that you can think through and you can see it on the profit margins where there's, you know, there's reasons to do both. Uh, and and some you'll find more growth than others. And some it may just be more about the margins and it's, uh, you know, lots of things to think about. But I think this today at least gives you a feel of the different types of segments and options and that you kind of see that Tommy's seen all of it. So as we're going through it, you're going to hear a bunch of different answers and a bunch of different content that will come out to help continue to illuminate that. But for today, really, this was this was the goal to kind of let you meet the space and meet Tommy. So uh, I don't see any more questions right now. So what I would tell everybody is if you are wanting to find out more on this and, and pursue opportunities there, um, there are a few ways that we're going to help you get there over these next few weeks and months. So uh, we are going to have these webinars. So every Thursday at, at two, just like they are now, they're going to we're going to have these webinars, and they will be on YouTube. Uh, we also have a one on one course that is live on our Route Consultant page right now that is free to go watch to give you some more insight into what this space looks like. And we're working on the Digital uh, New Investor Summit and, uh, and and master classes as well for you to continue to find ways where if you do decide to pursue this space. We want to help you partner with Tommy and, and our team so that you can understand what you're getting into and really be successful as you take over. Uh, and then in the meantime, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to our team directly uh, at info at routeconsultant.com. The other thing just to be thinking about, uh, we have happy hours across the country, uh, and those are for logistics of any type. And so there will be times where I'll be there. Uh, some of us will be at those. So if you want to go ahead and look at our events page, uh, we do have those. Those are free. So if you're trying to just meet us where we are instead of coming down to our office, uh, we'll we'll 
uh, be across the country, usually traveling and, you know, once a month uh, to different places. So we might be in your neck of the woods and we'll have a free happy hour in your area. So you can register for those as well. Um, now, uh, besides all of that, I just wanted to first off, thank you, Tommy, for being here and, and being here to answer all these questions and give all of your insight here. And looking forward to uh, continuing this relationship and building this partnership as we look at this space. Enjoy yeah. it. Look and then for everybody it. else, thanks for being here as well. And we are we're looking forward to seeing you all here on the next webinar and that we will hopefully see more of you soon as you start to dig into this space. And again, uh, the, the email is in the chat if you have any, uh, if you're trying to reach out to us, info at rockconsultant.com. But for all of that, uh, we will see you all next week. So thanks for being here. We'll see you next week. Thank you.